to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Mark chapter 7, verse number 37. We welcome you today to our study of the gospel of Mark. Mark is unique in that Mark is writing about the power and the majesty of Jesus, and he says so much about what Jesus does, and it reminds us of the powerful king and his majesty that we serve today. And so we're so glad that you joined us for our broadcast, and we want to welcome you to our study today. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today, as always. We want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective play stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Mark chapter 7 introduces us to the idea in verse 37 of the power and the majesty of Jesus with those beautiful words. He has done all things well. As we think today in our study of Mark, about the first four chapters, Mark 1 through 4, we're introduced to Jesus, his teaching, his power, and his miracles. But as you think about Mark itself, I want to give just a little introductory to the book of Mark. The gospel accounts themselves are unique in that the gospel, the, the New Testament, breaks down into four very unique categories. We have the gospel accounts, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which teach us about the life of Christ. They tell us about Jesus' birth, who he was, what he taught, the miracles that he did, and ultimately his death, burial, and resurrection. Then the second category in the New Testament is the book of Acts. It, in essence, says, now that you know who Jesus is, Here's how you become a follower of His. The book of Acts, the second category, is all about what must I do to become a Christian? What must I do to be saved? Then that third category, Romans through Jude, emphasizes now that you know who Jesus is, now that you know how to become a follower of His, 
Here's how you live faithfully to him every day. Romans through Jude is all about Christian living. And then that fourth category, the final stanza, the book of Revelation, is about the victory we have in Jesus being faithful unto death and our victory in every way. And so we're in that first category. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and inside that category, the four gospel accounts kind of each put a different stroke on it, each give it a different uh, emphasis, if you would use that word. Matthew is a Jew writing to the Jews, emphasizing from the Old Testament scripture that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews, the greatest Jew to ever live, and that the Old Testament affirms that. Mark is unique in that Mark is believed to be some of a Roman background, Mark Antony, that name being Roman in some ways. Mark seems to be writing to the Romans about the power and the majesty of Jesus. And so Mark is a Roman writing to the Romans about the powerful deeds of Christ. The Romans were a, a military-minded people. Mark thus focuses less on what Jesus said and more on what he did. You won't hear as many parables, but you'll see a lot of the action. And so Mark will say something like, Jesus did this, and immediately he went and did this. The word straightway, uh, King James uses the word anon, immediately. It occurs 52 times in this book, thus emphasizing the, the urgency and the immediacy of what Jesus was doing. And so Mark emphasizes the majesty and the power of our Lord and Savior. As we said, the key verse, Mark chapter 7, verse 37, Jesus has done all things well. Look at his majesty. See his power. Be impressed with his life and the many great deeds that he did. And that's the vantage point from which Mark presents the gospel of Mark. And so it's a beautiful picture of Christ and his power. Mark starts off in Mark chapter 1 verse 1 on a high note. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so from that point forward, Mark begins to move through the life of Jesus to show us his power, show us his deeds, but think about what he says even in that initial verse. The beginning of the gospel. The gospel means good news. It is that which is presented to uplift, to give man hope and joy. And when we talk about the good news of Jesus Christ, we're talking about man leaving a life of despair and a life of sin, and a life of heartache, and Jesus bringing hope and joy to our lives through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And of course, Mark presents it as the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His deity is emphasized throughout the book. Mark wants us to realize his power comes from the ultimate source Almighty God, because Jesus himself is divine. And so in the first four chapters of this book today, we're going to hit the highlights and show some of the, the majesty and power of Jesus as it's initially seen. Chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, we are introduced to Jesus right after a little bit said about John, the forerunner. We're now introduced to Jesus Christ at his baptism. Look in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 with me. The Bible says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, in whom? I am well pleased. And so here we've got the interaction of John. Then Jesus comes on the scene where John is baptizing. He's baptized by John. And the Bible says, and it tells us about Jesus' baptism and God's confirmation of his son. Listen to these words. And immediately coming up from the water. The literal Greek wording there is ek. And that means out of. Literally coming up out of the water. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, descended upon him. 
Now, friend, there's a couple of very important principles that we learn about Jesus here. And the first is, when he submitted to baptism, we learn about the mode of baptism. In our Christian world, people will talk about baptism, and they may mean sprinkling, they may mean pouring, they may mean immersion, or any or a combination of the three. How was Jesus baptized? What do we learn about baptism from the baptism of Jesus? Listen to it again. Immediately coming up literally out of the water. Now, the question is this. To come up out of water, what must you first do? Well, you've got to go down into the water. Jesus was immersed, and every time you see baptism in the Bible, in the New Testament, it is immersion. That's what the word baptizo means. But then notice that second thing. After Jesus was baptized, God's confirmation by the Holy Spirit comes upon him, and you hear the voice of God, This is my beloved Son, in whom? I am well pleased. And so not only do we see Jesus submitting to the will of God, but you hear the voice of God, the proclamation from on high. We need to listen to and pay attention to what this man is going to say. Then in Mark chapter 1, the mission of Jesus moves further into its work while Jesus calls the disciples. And I want you to see what Jesus calls them to be from Fishers of fish. Jesus now calls fishers of men. Look in Mark chapter 1, verse number 16 and 17. The Bible says, As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And the Bible says that immediately they left their nets and followed him. To these men, no doubt, who are committed to, some of them committed to John's teaching, all, most of them, all of them committed to the, to the old law and following that principle, we now see these fishers of fish transformed. Follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Friend, we see Jesus' mission, and we're reminded of the Christian mission as well. Luke 19.10. At the conclusion of speaking to Zacchaeus at his home, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. The mission of Jesus is the greatest mission in the world. To save people who are lost in sin, to save their soul, and ultimately to help them go to heaven. And friend, that mission is my mission and your mission today. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. Friend, as we think about the majesty of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one of the things that I am thoroughly impressed with throughout the book of Mark and throughout much of the gospel account is the power of Jesus in his prayer life. I want you to notice what the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. As we think about the prayer life of Jesus, I want you to consider this. As Jesus is in the midst of his ministry, the Bible says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Think about what Jesus did here. People, he's been doing his work. He's been performing miracles. People are impressed already with this power that he has and Jesus needs for just a moment to get away from all that and to have fellowship and to ask for God's help. Friend, if Jesus needed that, what about me and you today? Think about how he started his day. In the morning, great while before daylight, Jesus, he got up early, he got away from the, the troubles and the problems and the, and the chaos of life that was about to unfold probably. And he took time. In the morning, a great while before daylight, he departed and went to a solitary place where he could have peace and quiet and relax. And there he prayed. If it was that important every day for the Son of God, 
the Savior of the world, God himself, to spend time in prayer, how much more so me and you? See, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person overcomes much. James 5, 16. We can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in our time of need. But now moving into Mark chapter 2. As Jesus begins to go about in the region of Judea, Galilee, and Israel and preach the gospel, his whole mission is to help lost people to be saved. And in Mark chapter 2, as Jesus comes to an area, the crowd is so flocks to him so much that there's no more room in the house that Jesus is in. And so there's this man in the area who's lame. He can't walk. He's disabled. Hands and feet don't work. He's on a, a bed. This person, in our mind, way of thinking, is a paralytic in some ways. And so Jesus is in the house preaching. He's, this man has four really good friends, and they've heard about the power and the miracles and the fame of Jesus, and they hate to see their friend in this predicament, and so they want to get him to Jesus. But the problem is, there's no room there. They, they can't get to him, can't get to the Lord, and the next thing you know, Jesus is preaching, and the roof begins to come off the house where he's at. And you can imagine looking up. And here these four men have tied ropes to this man and they're letting him down at Jesus' feet. In their mind, if they can get this man to Jesus, he can take care of him. And Jesus, of course, does that. Mark chapter 2, Jesus heals this man. Uh, the man is healed of his paralysis. He says to the man, Son, Go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven you. That man is healed. He goes his way. And what a great blessing it is. But in the midst of that, some of the people there, they kind of put two and two together. Who can forgive sins but God? And they kind of think Jesus is blasphemous for saying that. But really, that was the whole point. The miracle proved. That Jesus had that power. When Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven you, and when he did that great miracle, and when they reasoned in their mind, well, wait a minute now, who can forgive sins but God? The miracle proved Jesus had that power. His statement proved he was God in the flesh. And listen to what Jesus says as they begin to complain and reason in their heart. Mark chapter 2. Notice what the scripture says in verse number 10. But that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say, arise to you, take up your bed, and go to your house. That man was forgiven of his sin. He was healed of his paralysis. And the miracle proved Jesus was the Son of God. And what was that really all about? Notice Mark chapter 2, verse number 17. When Jesus began to hear their complaining about Matthew and him eating with sinners, he said to them, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All of Mark chapter 2. It, it shows the power of Jesus in his miracles. It, the, 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 the healing of the, uh, the paralytic showed that. Him calling Matthew showed that he didn't just come to rub elbows with the elite. But here's the whole point of it all. It wasn't to make people feel better. It wasn't to make some people feel bad because Jesus didn't go to their house. Mark 2 verse 17. The whole mission of Jesus. Jesus didn't come to make good people feel better. So that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth. He would go to those people and he would say, those who are well, have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call sinners, uh, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Think about the, the, the amazing logic and practicality of what Jesus said. Imagine it this way. Let's say tomorrow morning, you wake up feeling on top of the world. I mean, nothing hurts. You've, you've had a good night's sleep. You've got all the energy in the world. You are ready to go out and conquer the day. You feel like you're on top of your game. What's the chances you're going to say, Oh, I sure feel good today. I better go call the doctor. 
<laughs> it don't work that way, right? That, 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 those who are well, they don't need a physician. But those who are sick, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you think you're the religious elite, you don't need me, you don't think. These sinners, they all needed him. But Jesus came to call the sinners, those who knew that they needed God, knew that they needed help. And friend, all of us are sinners, right? Romans 3 verse 23, that reminds us we need to realize our need and we need to realize the need for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And my friend, one of the things that broke Jesus' heart over and over again in the gospel was when people had a hard heart. Mark chapter 3 verse 5, in this context, Jesus is grieved by the hardness of some people's hearts. Their hearts were so hard, their minds were so closed, they were so pious and self-righteous in their own mind that they didn't need a savior. Friend, until I realize that I'm a sinner, that even at my best, I can't save myself, that all my righteousness is like filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse six, until I realize how much I need Jesus, what good do I have for a Savior? And so today we think about how much we need the Lord and Savior. In Mark chapter 3 then, Jesus is now doing more miracles. He is now healing again those who are sick. And in this occasion, Jesus sees the hard-heartedness of some of these people. And in the context, Jesus is going to show even his power over Satan. Look in Mark chapter 3, and as Jesus is talking about a house divided among itself, they begin to say of Jesus, the only way he can do these miracles is because he is a worker of Beelzebub. Beelzebub, the chief of the demons, is with him. He's doing miracles and has this power by Satan. And they say he's out of his mind. Satan's working through him. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait just a minute. If I'm casting out demons by the power of the chief of the demons, you've got a little problem with that. And he says, nobody, let, let me use an illustration, Jesus says, nobody can bind the strong man unless he's stronger than him. You can't beat the best boxer boxing unless you're a better boxer. You can't out-wrestle the best wrestler around unless you're a better wrestler than him. Jesus' point is, I'm casting out demons. I am actually tearing down the work of Satan. The only person who could do that, I'm not doing that. Why would Satan give me the power to tear down Satan? That doesn't make any sense. The only way I can do that is because I'm stronger than him. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse number 27. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Well, what's Jesus talking about? Strong man plundering his goods. Nobody's going to go in and defeat these demons and tear down the work of Satan and plunder what he's doing unless he's stronger than Satan. And that's the whole point. Jesus' miracles, his ability to cast out demons, all of that proves his power and exactly who he is. Now, let's turn our attention, if you would, to Mark chapter 4 for just a moment. In Mark chapter 4, you've got the parable of the sower and that, that parable teaching us that the word of God is the seed. Our responsibility is to go out and to sow. There are four types of hearts, four types of soils. We need to make sure that the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the, the desire for things, that Satan's not sneaking in and stealing the word, but just as much as anything, we need to make sure that we've got a good and honest heart. What type of soil am I? What type of soil are you? The word can't take good root in your heart unless you've got good soil. You've got to get rid of the weeds and the thorns and the cares of the world. And don't let something else come in and, and choke it away. But really the lesson that I want you to see in Mark chapter 4, I want you to notice in your Bible beginning in verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, 
Jesus said, Let us cross over the other side. Now when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Then he arose, rebuked the wind and the sea, and said, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And listen to this. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Friend, I want you to think about what if, what if I were in this boat? What if you were in this boat? We're out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee on both side, on, on, on the sides of the Sea of the Galilee. There are high rock cliffs. The wind comes down that rock cliff like a, a roller coaster going across a, a big hill. That wind hits that hill and comes down and it makes that sea tumultuous. And we're in the sea and it's white capping and the, the boat's filling the water and it's starting to give a little closer to, the, to, 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 to sinking. And, and Jesus, where's he at? Asleep in the stern. And the disciples are bailing water and they're frantic. And they finally wake Jesus up and say, Hey, wake up. Don't you care that we're about to drown here? And Jesus, peace, be still. It's like a sea of glass. And they feared exceedingly. And they said, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obeys him? As Mark presents the majesty of Jesus, who has the power to control the elements? Who controls the wind? Who controls the sea? The lightning, the rain, the thunder? Who has power over all of that? Only God. When Jesus did that, it proved ma masterfully his power. And when Jesus said those words, peace be still, doesn't that remind us of the peace that brings into our life? Friend, if you're not a child of God, today we urge you, submit your life to the master of all things. Obey the gospel, follow Jesus, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins and live faithful to him every day. Thank you for joining us today and we hope you'll join us next time as we think about more of the gospel of Christ from the book of Mark. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand, and downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the Gospel of Christ.